How do you make a Nazi cry? That sounds like the setup to a joke, doesn't it? Well, believe it or not, it's no joke. That's our topic today. It feels absurd to imagine a Nazi with feelings. And to some extent, even actual Nazis felt that that was absurd. The ideal Nazi man was hard as Krupp steel, and there was no room for regrets or traditional soft morality, let alone feelings. And yet, there were times for these manliest of men when it was okay to cry. There were times when it was okay to show a tender side, to empathize, even to cry. What was it like for men in the Nazi regime? Was it one long series of yeah bros and fist bumps? Or was it more complicated? That's what we're talking about today. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the history of sex. The History of Sex is sponsored by Dr. Jillian Kenny, historian of women, sex, and magic in medieval Europe. In 1941, one Nazi soldier recorded his impressions of his regiment's commander. While all men are on the ground taking cover from shrapnel and missiles, Lieutenant Colonel Lutwitz stands upright amid it all during the attack, stoically assessing the situation, pondering the options, eventually making his decisions, a true leader with sweeping power. None of his men ever saw him dither or yield. The soldier, meanwhile, says he feels, quote, like a rabbit, unquote in comparison. Now that humble soldier is Lieutenant Fritz Farnbacher, who served on the Eastern Front in the 4th Tank Division. And despite such impressive credits, I would think just even being in a tank division is enough to establish your masculinity. But despite that, Farnbacher describes himself as serving in a motherly capacity, quote-unquote, nursing wounded comrades, cooking and organizing Christmas parties. You can feel the self-derision in his account the painful consciousness of not measuring up, not being man enough. He idolizes his commander, and in doing so, he feels the chasm between his idol and himself. Today, we are acutely conscious of toxic messaging, especially that aimed at young girls who, for example, flip through fashion magazines and despair to ever meet such impossible standards. And yet, it is only quite recently that we have begun to consider how males, too, might be demoralized in similar ways. Certainly, Lieutenant Farnbacher was affected as he stood in awe of his commander, and no doubt so, too, were many more like him. Now, the buzzword to describe this today is toxic masculinity. Now, I know some people love this term and some absolutely do not like it at all. And the fact that there is no single authoritative definition really doesn't help the situation. So we should definitely be clear about what we mean. So toxic masculinity does not mean that all masculinity is bad. Rather, it refers to certain aspects and practices of traditional Western masculinity that may be harmful to women, children, and indeed men themselves. And the word toxic is actually quite useful because it underscores that this may not just be a moral question, but actually a health question. For example, men are known to have higher rates of skin cancer. Why? Well, a proposed explanation is that it is seen as unmanly to put on sunscreen, like you're supposed to be just so rugged and outdoorsy like the Marlboro Man that you don't need sunscreen. Similarly, Men have higher rates of infection for many STDs due to a perceived need to play the field, higher rates of death in car accidents due to risky driving, higher rates of successful suicide by violence, and so on down the line. The point is that certain traits of traditional masculinity, when taken to extremes, can be harmful not only to those around men, but also to men themselves. <laughs> 
so what about Nazi men? Was their brand of masculinity toxic? Well, on the one hand, the answer is undeniably yes. I mean, they were racist warmongers culminating in genocide, so they were definitely harmful to those around them. And this is relevant because their masculinity was inextricably bound up with their racism since they rooted their machismo in their racial superiority. For example, Nazi politician and academic Cleo Player claimed that even in death, Aryan soldiers would, quote, retain their composure, unquote, and not moan or whine, and that is in direct contrast to the, quote, tearful way of dying, unquote, of other people. So it's very much bound up with their racism. Meanwhile, the strong, masculine, brave Aryan was explicitly contrasted with the Jew, who was supposedly the opposite in every way, weak, effeminate, and cowardly. That was definitely not true, but that's what their propaganda said. So, long story short, there's no separating Nazi masculinity from Nazi racism. In that sense, it is undeniably toxic. And you could say the same thing about Nazi masculinity and women. We've already seen in this series how they subordinated women and funneled them into the one single role of mothering the next generation of little Hitlers. And in addition, men defined themselves over and against women. The SA, or stormtroopers, the ones with the brown uniforms, actually went so far as to ban members from pushing baby carriages in public because this was seen as a feminine act. Imagine that, in a state so focused on getting the population up, some men were literally banned from public acts of parenting. Now, in contrast, the SS, the ones in the black uniforms, did try to overcome this public perception in an article from its newspaper, Das Schwarze Corps, which boldly published a photo of a soldier pushing a baby carriage with the caption, This father fears nothing unmanly to his appearance. He decreases the troubles of his wife. And yet, the fact that this must be said really just belies the anxiety that men, even SS men, commonly experienced over such acts. Parenting, when it came to caretaking as opposed to merely spreading your seed far and wide, was a female-coded endeavor. Consequently, masculinity concerns increased the burden for women and also deprived children of potential bonding time with their fathers, so in this respect, too, Nazi masculinity can be fairly argued to have been harmful to women, not to mention children. In short, the question of whether Nazi masculinity was toxic to those around men is a pretty clear yes. However, a more interesting question, if only because it's not such an open-shut case, is whether Nazi masculinity was toxic to the men themselves. For example, what were the consequences to those Nazi fathers who were proud of their children and perhaps yearning to bond with them, but who nevertheless felt they had to hold back for fear of social ridicule? Was Nazi masculinity toxic to men? And if so, how and to what extent? To answer that, we need to get a fuller picture of the ideal Nazi man. Hitler elaborates the perfect man in a speech to the Hitler Youth at Nuremberg in 1935, where he exhorts young boys to become swift as a greyhound, tough as leather, and hard as Krupp steel. Now, Krupp was a local manufacturer of steel, of which the Nazis were quite proud, hence Krupp steel. Now, these traits listed by Hitler, swift as a greyhound, tough as leather, and hard as Krupp steel, manifested above all in the soldier, who served as the paradigm for Nazi masculinity. Now, not all men were soldiers, of course. Unlike women, they were allowed more than one role. You had farmers, you had laborers, businessmen, bureaucrats, and so on. But nevertheless, just as all Americans have something of the cowboy at heart, so all Germans had something of the soldier at heart. It defined masculinity at all levels of society. Now, the martial traits, the soldierly traits that we've heard so far, swiftness, toughness, hardness, probably do not sound all that unique, and indeed they were common all across the modern West at the time. However, the Nazi soldier manifested them in a context that was quite unique for a modern Western culture, and that context was comradeship. Now this is absolutely key to the Nazi sense of manliness, so we're going to go into some depth here on this concept. The word in German is Kameradschaft, which literally means comradeship, 
And now I know that normally when we in the West, or at least Americans hear comrade, we think of communists, but don't let a Nazi hear you say that because they hated them, the Bolsheviks were their arch nemesis. But see, it wasn't only communists who valorized comradeship. Fascists did too. But it wasn't a comradeship of the proletariat. It was the comradeship of a people, a race, a national community. You are nothing, your people is all is the way that Hitler famously put it. Now, the notion of comradeship is the sense of belonging to a greater whole. And it's quite different from friendship. It's not friendship. Friends are people that you choose, but you don't choose your comrades. Comrades are chosen for you by circumstance. So a comrade is not the same as a friend. Quite to the contrary, in fact. To call someone a comrade is to acknowledge that whether or not you would have chosen them, whether or not you even like them, you are both part of the same greater whole. And so you are going to stand by each other, shoulder to shoulder, you can count on each other, you are one in the greater whole. The greater whole of which you are each a part exists on two scales. Now on the grand scale, it is the national community, the Volksgemeinschaft, as it is in German. Folk means people, Gemeinschaft means community, people's community. Volksgemeinschaft. You might also translate that more loosely as racial community, perhaps, because it certainly was that for the Nazis. Now, this was the greater whole on the grand scale, while on the smaller scale, there was the squad, your company, your platoon or unit. You know, the guys that you know face to face are also a greater whole to which you belong. In fact, you may well have felt more attachment to your squad than the national community. After all, whatever doubts you might secretly feel about the racial propaganda, these guys at least were the ones that you counted on when the bullets started flying. You could not doubt that, nor could you afford to give them any reason to doubt you. Consequently, you expressed in every word and action that they could count on you, and that is what it meant to be a comrade. Now, it's fairly unusual for a modern Western society to focus on this kind of collectivist bond. Generally, Western cultures are more individualistic, and indeed at the time, the French, the British, and the Americans actually all toyed with the concept of comradeship, but ultimately rejected it as basically soul-crushing and went instead in an individualistic direction. Germany, however, went the opposite route, valorizing comradeship into a manly ideal. Why did Germany turn out so differently? Well, the reason goes back even before World War I. That's right, for once in this series, we're actually going back before World War I. In fact, we have to go all the way back to the 19th century in 1871. Germany had only unified quite recently. That happened in 1871. Before that, it was a fractured patchwork of independent statelets, each with their own identities. So Germans were divided, and furthermore, they were also divided along religious lines, with some of the regions being staunchly Catholic and others fiercely Protestant. And finally, traditional German society was divided in another way. It was highly class conscious. Aristocrats towered over commoners, who in turn towered over certain professions that were deemed nigh untouchable. For example, knackers. Do you know what a knacker is? It's those people who dispose of dead animal carcasses. Professions like these were deemed close to untouchable in traditional German society. So, in short, the German people had far more dividing them than they had uniting them. However, all of this dissolved in the do-or-die trenches of the Great War. Aha, now we're to World War I. See, an aristocrat might find himself elbow to elbow with a knacker or a Catholic with a Protestant, and they'd have no one to rely on but each other. And this was the birth of German comradeship. It was a bond having nothing to do with liking each other. Rather, it was a bond in spite of disliking each other. The military uniform became 
the great equalizer, erasing or at least concealing the differences between you and the man next to you. And this had a far greater impact on the German psyche than it did for other Western European peoples, precisely because the Germans had been so divided. They went into the Great War divided, but came out of it united. That was the experience in the trenches, anyway. Unity never quite caught on at home, nor did it really hold together after the war, even for veterans. Yet, for that very reason, conservative war veterans clung to the memory of their experiences in the trenches all the more fervently, romanticizing and even idealizing the comradeship that they experienced there. Then, when some of those same veterans began developing the new ideology of National Socialism, i.e. Nazism, they placed comradeship at its very core. And that is how, when everyone else in Western Europe was zigging individualist, Germany zagged collectivist. That's how it came to be that commitment to the collective formed the unique context of Nazi masculinity. The German military code even spelled this out explicitly. The soldier has to get along with his comrades. He may not abandon them in battle, in times of distress or danger, but must support them as much as possible whenever they need him. And in order to demonstrate that he could be relied on in battle, a man behaved like a comrade even outside it. Every moment, every act was an opportunity to show that he transcended his own individuality and gave himself over to the greater whole. And you can see that in the vast seas of men at Nazi rallies all raising a fascist salute as one body, or the parade units all marching to the goose step. You see it in the uniforms, you see it in the Heil Hitlers, and the swastikas on everything from cars to baby cradles. I bet they even had swastika branded underwear. All of these things, in so many different ways, say the same thing. In short, they say, I am a part of the whole, I am a comrade. It's a masculinity designed to show willingness to suppress childish individuality and express adult male participation in the collective being. This context of comradeship is quite unique indeed for a modern Western culture. In fact, it feels much more akin to something in East Asia, like in a place like Japan. Maybe that's why Hitler and Hirohito got along so well, I don't know. But in any case, the Nazi comrade is definitely not the individualistic American cowboy that rides into town alone, solves a problem alone, and then rides off into the sunset alone. No, no, no. The Nazi comrade does nothing alone. That's the whole point. His strength lies in joining together with his comrades to become even more powerful. He's less like a cowboy and more like a power ranger. <laughs> so what was it like to be a comrade? Was it joyful? Oppressive? Both? We're going to find out, but first, we'll take a short break, and we'll be back after this. If you'd like a broader overview of the Nazi regime, you can hardly do better than William Shirer's monumental classic, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, available now on Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash btnewberg and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. Why Audible? Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news comedy, and more from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, and entertainers. For example, you can get Shirer's classic, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, already mentioned, or, for something less conventional, why not check out Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields by Wendy Lauer, which challenges our notions that women are not as brutal as men. You can find this and more on Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash btnewberg. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash btnewberg for your free audiobook. And now, The History of Sex presents this. Look out! Fall back! We can't win, unless we must form Megafuhrer. Each of us must transform and become one. Together, we will become the giant robot called Megafuhrer. Form arms and legs. Form torso. Form head and mustache. Megafuhrer forward! <laughs> 
All right, we're back. So, what was it like to be a comrade? Now, truth be told, the analogy of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers is actually not that far off the mark. A team that can fight individually, but achieves its greatest strength by forming into one super body called Megazord. <laughs> but the super body for the Nazis was the national community, or the squad. Soldiers cheered this with catchy slogans like, Should our arses turn to leather, we'll stick together. Similarly, one Nazi soldier by the name of Kurt Chrysler, no relation to the car, wrote in a letter to his parents, We want to stick together, we want to fight together, or we want to get wounded together. That is what we are longing for. Now, for many, comradeship was a joy. Soldier Sebastian Hafner, for example, wrote that, it was a pleasure to go for a cross-country run together in the morning, and then to go naked into the communal hot showers together, to share the parcels that one or another received from home, to share also responsibility for misdemeanors that one of your comrades had committed. Wait, wait. <laughs> I got the first ones there, but what was that last thing he said? Sharing responsibility for misdeeds was a pleasure? Those of us who do not share a collectivist mindset might find that a little bit odd. But see, the general feeling can actually be grasped easily enough from a pair of stories of soldiers in training related by historian Thomas Kuna, which is actually where almost all of today's quotes and letters and everything comes from. Thomas Kuna relates, While Hans Lorenz was at a pub with his comrades, their first such excursion after three weeks in the military, his belt and his gun were stolen. Three days of detention awaited him. A soldier was responsible for his gear, and there were no excuses. His comrades, however, held a council of war and decided that one of them would report sick every day so that Hans could borrow the sick soldier's gun and belt. And they continued this scheme until they were permitted another pub visit, at which time Hans managed to procure a gun and belt in the same way that he had lost his own. <laughs> now, hearing that, I think... Even the most dyed-in-the-wool individuals can pick up the feeling of togetherness that we're seeing here. I mean, it's, it's almost heartwarming. It's like something out of chicken soup for the Nazi soul. Now, the second story related by Kuna drives home this same point. Hans Karl Vorster's unit took revenge on a particularly malicious drill sergeant. After the sergeant had got drunk and fallen fast asleep one night, his trainees, Vorster and his comrades, secured a padlock around his testicles, and threw away the key. The next day, agonizingly, the sergeant had to carry out his duties with his hand in his trouser pocket to minimize the discomfort. His recruits, however, were delighted, and they stuck together when the sergeant demanded that the culprit reveal himself. Together they got through the inevitable punishment with conspiratorial indifference. <laughs> How's that for togetherness? I mean, these anecdotes demonstrate the kind of day-to-day -day ways in which soldiers expressed their willingness to stand by each other, even in the face of punishment. And knowing that you could rely on your comrades and that you yourself were a worthy comrade as well was uplifting. It bolstered soldiers in the face of adversity. They knew that if they could count on each other in the face of punishment, so too could they count on each other in the face of death. And this was the joy of comradeship. However, comradeship also had its dark side. Above and beyond the racist and misogynist underpinnings, which we've already touched on, it could also be oppressive to the men themselves. Those who were wounded and hospitalized often felt such a need to rejoin their comrades on the front that guilt basically riddled their only respite from the terrors of the front lines. And you can see this, for example, in the struggles of Helmut Wiesmann. While hospitalized in Austria, he wrote to his wife Edith of his traumatic experiences. These terrible thoughts about the front are destroying me, he says. Yet, when his wife tries to console him by pointing out that, at least for the moment, he's away from the killing fields, he writes back furiously, Exactly this proves that you'll never understand what this is all about. When I only think of it, I feel I should report back to the front right away. I can if I want, he writes, but at the same time, he also lays bare his inner conflict. If I called myself a shirker, it wouldn't be wrong, but I am no coward, for God's sake. Nobody can call me a coward. The fear of being labeled a coward kept soldiers returning to their comrades again and again. 
In fact, it was not uncommon for those returning to the front to be chided by their comrades for not attempting to escape the hospital sooner. <laughs> you come back from being wounded. I can't even imagine being wounded, much less being wounded than coming back and having somebody say, how come you didn't try to escape the hospital? <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. Now, Visman was a soldier who bought into comradeship hook, line, and sinker, but not all were so convinced. How much more difficult was it then for those less perfectly suited to the herd mentality of the Nazi regime? Nazi comradeship did not make it easy for such men. Joining in group leisure activities, for example, was not optional if you were in the Nazi Wehrmacht. Singing songs was a ubiquitous Nazi pastime, for example, and as soldier Franz Wischenberg wrote, when the music played, Woe betide him who won't open his mouth. Wissenberg endured comradeship and died in action in 1945. Similarly, another soldier, Willy Peter Rees, and yes, that is apparently a German name, that's the one he used on his autobiography after the war, so that's how we'll refer to him here. In his autobiography, he wrote that he wore the mask of a soldier, never being alone, but always a stranger among strangers. And he fell into a state of apathy, devolving into Sadness and despair, emptiness and fear. A year later, Reese too was dead, killed on the Eastern Front. A third soldier, Heinrich Bull, wrote, The party last night again made me really aware of my individualism. A hundred and thirty men herded and squeezed together, sweating, all looking alike and ordered to be happy, boozing and gabbling and bowling. What a torture, these military exhilarations. In fact, Bull lived in fear of sticking out. Often and massively I have been standing out in the most unfavorable ways these days, and now they all keep an eye on me, he writes, even noting that his superiors seem, quote, to have plotted to kill me, unquote. Unlike the two soldiers previously quoted, Bull actually survived the war and went on to become a pacifist activist. Now his words underscore the implicit rule of the comrade. The nail that sticks out gets hammered down. Now, sometimes the hammer came down from above, from superiors, but most often it was actually self-enforced by fellow comrades. Those who stuck out were given the Holy Spirit, as tank division soldier Dieter Wellershoff put it. He recalls an orphan from the countryside who was entirely incapable of keeping up with the mental and physical standards of our training group. Because of him, our group always attracted attention and was punished and degraded as a whole. Consequently, it came time for the hammer. At night, they ripped the orphan from his bed, manhandled him into a pack, and then pushed him under the shower until terror overcame him. Now, cruel as that may sound, this orphan actually got off relatively easy. Others in similar situations were shunned or even physically beaten. In short, the pressure to conform was oppressive. If you want to talk about toxic masculinity, I mean, there it is. The demands of Nazi manliness enforced themselves upon men in violence, both psychological and physical. This was what it was like to be a man in the Nazi collective. I can only imagine the health consequences that must have been consequent upon these sorts of experiences. But it went even beyond this. Now, most of what we've been discussing thus far has been relatively innocuous, but the story is about to get much grimmer. Above all, a soldier's job is to kill. And for a Nazi soldier, that went beyond the traditional killing of enemy combatants and crossed over into unarmed civilians. Recent research has shown that it was not just special task forces like the Einsatzgruppen that carried out genocide. In fact, the average soldier in the German Wehrmacht, the army, was very much aware of and complicit in such killing. The number everyone remembers is six million slaughtered, but actually that's just the number of Jews that were killed in the Holocaust. In addition, there were also Poles, Slavs, Roma and Sinti, i.e. what we used to call gypsies, homosexuals, the mentally disabled, and many other classes of undesirables, quote-unquote. And in total, this came to something like 17 million 
in all. I've even seen higher estimates. And no small part of all that murder was by the hands of the common soldier in the Wehrmacht. Now this, too, was part of Nazi manhood. As historian Thomas Kuna explains, It was precisely the ability to neutralize guilty feelings about killing and other civilian restraints that made the soldier man one of the masterminds of German military masculinity. He managed to rid himself of scruples and pangs of conscience, civilian sentiments of humanness, the morality of the female-dominated world back home. And in this vein, SS officer Felix Landau proudly notes in his diary that after shooting defenseless people one day with an Einsatzkommando in Poland, he was, quote, completely unmoved, no pity, no nothing, unquote. Now it is of note that this was an SS officer, all of whom were volunteers and thoroughly Nazified, whereas many in the Wehrmacht were conscripts whose indoctrination was, shall we say, incomplete. And this meant that it was more difficult to shrug off the casual murder of unarmed civilians than for those in the SS. For those in the Wehrmacht, the army, although they too did pull the trigger, it haunted them all the more. Lieutenant Eugen Altroga, for example, wrote in a letter to his family, Last night we got together and talked about things that you have to feel ashamed of as a German. When you learn here what they do with the chosen people, this is not just anti-Semitism, this is inhumanity as you would not have thought possible in the 20th century, the enlightened modern time, how that will be avenged at some point. You might just run mad in despair of the meaning of this war, hearing such things, but what can we do? We have to shut up and stay on duty. Now the conflict of conscience is far more audible in this soldier's words compared to the SS officer we heard just a moment ago. And I can only imagine what he must have felt, you know, a cocktail of nausea at his own actions tinged with fear of retribution should his comrades notice that he has mixed feelings. And so he stuffs away his emotions and puts on a mask of indifference, as seen in his last line, but what can we do? We have to shut up and stay on duty. No doubt a lifetime of post-traumatic stress disorder awaited if he survived the war. He was pronounced missing in action in 1943. This was what it was like to be a man in Nazi Germany. The ideal Nazi male was physically and mentally exceptional due ostensibly to his racial superiority. He was loyal to his comrades and pitiless to his enemies, up to and including unarmed civilians, and he was, in Hitler's words, hard as Krupp steel. And yet, believe it or not, there were times when it was okay, even for these hardest of men, to show tenderness. Now it's finally time to ask in all earnestness the question from the very beginning of this episode. What makes a Nazi cry? We can begin with the words of Wehrmacht Lieutenant Tim Gephardt, who memorialized his regiment's fallen dead after the war in 1955. Oh, what is man? What is virility when death intervenes and obliterates everything? And he goes on to explain that comradeship requires empathy. That's right, empathy. Now, in another context, empathy might appear feminine, but not so in the context of comradeship. See, as Gephardt explains in his speech, empathy appears in sharing, quote, the hardships and worries of others, unquote. And it also appears when it comes down to rescuing a wounded soldier so that he won't fall into enemy hands. And when this wounded man, now a rescued comrade, feels his rescuer gently stroke his hair, just as a mother would, then he can die in peace. Now Gephardt's words, just as a mother would, are striking here. Remember, this is a culture so macho that pushing a baby carriage in public was banned for some men. And yet, Gephardt, without a hint of threat to his masculinity, valorizes a female-coded act. And remember, too, that this is not some private reminiscence, but a public memorial service in which he is speaking in front of other hard-chiseled warriors just like himself. How could Gephardt bear to reveal such tenderness? What allows men like this to take on the role of the feminine? <laughs> 
historian Thomas Kuna makes sense of it. Tender manliness, even crying, otherwise the epitome of unmanliness, became respectable in the presence of death. So, what makes a Nazi cry? Death. Death makes a Nazi cry. Doesn't sound so much like a joke anymore now, does it? Death is the context that makes it okay for a Nazi man to show feelings. Now, not any death, of course, not death of his enemies, not death of inferior races, and not even his own death, which he was supposed to go to with perfect stoicism, but death of his comrades. That's what makes a Nazi cry. It's as if the confrontation of death is itself so manly an act that the only way to express greater manliness is to turn the tables and gender roles invert when the Grim Reaper enters the room. Suddenly, the hardest of men are able to shed tears. Now, the fact that this context is temporary means that it can act as a sort of release valve without threatening a man's masculinity overall. See, once it's gone, normal gender roles resume, and then the man has an opportunity to reaffirm his masculinity by hardening once again. As Kuna puts it, The sphere of death ensured that the symbolic hierarchies hardness over weakness, were in effect. Death was the enabler for men to reaffirm themselves while purging some of the toxins built up from the burden of an oppressive form of masculinity. Now, the presence of death could be overt or it could be covert. You know, the scene described by Gephardt just now was close enough to the dying that you could actually stroke the guy's hair as he ebbed and faded. That's overt death, right? But often, the presence of death was invisible, and unspoken, yet somehow mutually acknowledged by two men who knew that they had both stared into its dark eye sockets. And we can see an example of that in the conclusion to the story of Lieutenant Farnbacher that we mentioned at the very beginning of this episode. You remember the one who idolized his commander and felt like a rabbit by comparison and thought derisively of himself as motherly, nursing, cooking, and preparing Christmas celebrations? That guy. His story actually ends by finding his manhood in the wake of death. See, during the assault on the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, Farnbacher befriends a junior officer by the name of Peter. And each time they meet, he says, We shake hands again and again, and then don't stop asking, How are you? And how have you been? And Farnbacher even tends to Peter while he's sleeping. He writes that he... Pops a cookie into Peter's mouth, but he doesn't notice it. He's so sound asleep, sitting up straight, so that I have to put a few more on his arm. There's another chicken soup for the Nazi soul. Now, in late November of that year, however, Peter sustains a mortal wound in battle. As his friend slowly slips from life, Farnbacher fell despondent, thinking of their mothers at home and feeling like he'd lost a part of himself. And the guy literally died in his arms. And he was broken, but he was not alone. See, two of Farnbacher's comrades came to console him empathetically. And he writes that they were shaking hands with me heartily because they know what close friends we were. And the comrades refused to leave him alone until he returns to the front with them, where he and they reunite in battle. Our men put up a good fight, Farnbacher concludes. His masculinity was assured by confronting death. He temporarily opened the floodgates of emotion, then closed them again when it came time to stand shoulder to shoulder with his comrades again. And no doubt they respected him more after that, for now he shared with them that silent and invisible but somehow mutually acknowledged experience of overcoming death. Now, was that sufficient antidote to counteract all the toxic masculinity imbibed by Lieutenant Farnbacher in the rest of the war? I don't know. I doubt it. But I don't know. What do you think? Is toxic masculinity a fair description of Nazi manhood as we've heard it today? Or at least parts of Nazi manhood? Or is it an unfair description applied to any version of manhood? I open it up to you. You can share your thoughts on Facebook where we are at History of Sex Pod. I'd love to hear from you.
With this episode, we've begun to fracture the monolithic Nazi ideal to reveal a measure of variety and differences of feeling that actually obtained. And there was a whole lot more diversity in Germany than you might have thought, certainly more than I ever thought, even within the Nazi ranks. For example, did you know that for a time the second most powerful man in the Nazi party was gay? Or that cross-dressing was a bizarrely common practice in the German army? Now how could that be? In a party as maniacally devoted to the straight and narrow as this, how could there be any room at all for such meandering paths? And what was it like for those queer individuals? That's what we'll be talking about in two months for our final installment of our super deep dive series, Sex in the Third Reich. Meanwhile, we've got some short shorts coming up this month. We're going to take a closer look at the possibly contradictory expectations that the German man must be both soldier and father in one being. And we're going to delve into what it was like for Jewish men in such tragic, tragic times. That's what we've got for the remainder of this month. Meanwhile, if you like what we're doing here, you can support the show by subscribing, rating, and reviewing. You can also pledge on Patreon, where $5 a month gets you a portrait in the time period and culture of your choosing. I will draw you as a tough-as-nails tank commander, hard as crip steel, or as a questioning quiet fellow, decorating the tank cannon like a Christmas tree. Or whatever you like, I'll make you look awesome, I promise. Just go to www.patreon.com slash btnewberg. That's patreon.com slash b-t-n-e-w-b-e-r-g. That's it for today, folks. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the history of sex. Podcast theme music mixed from tracks by Kevin McLeod. For additional credits, references, photos, and more, see our website at www.historyofsexpod.com.